She, if you haven't had a chance to check in, it's got attendance today, it's got the topical study assignment, and according to the very first syllabus you got, both books are due to be read by today. So those are the three check marks. Next time will be really the only thing will be the paraphrase that you're going to do for, for the class tonight and your memory work, and then we'll do the final. So those will be the only thing. So today, uh, and if you haven't finished your reading, try to do it by next Thursday, because after that, uh, we're done. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and uh, we are so excited that, uh, Lord, the more we learn about the special revelation that you have given us through the living word, Jesus Christ, through the written word of Scripture, Lord, your Holy Spirit who inspires and illuminates both. Father, we just thank you that uh, we can be those people who uh, benefit from your generosity and your grace in giving us your word. So, Lord, as we continue to uh, unpack even more tools so that we can be... Uh, better uh, workmen handling your word accurately, Lord. Not ashamed, Lord, because we are diligent in that, Lord. We just uh, pray that you would continue to find teachable hearts among every one of us in this room, Lord, and that everything that happens here tonight would be for your glory. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, so, uh, you've got your Koinonia study, right? Everybody did, so you did a wrap-up on Koinonia based upon our conversation last time, right? And then you did uh, a study on your own, another topic. So before we go to what you did, just give me uh, some wrap-up on the what of Koinonia. Anybody? What? The what? What is it? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Koinonia. Okay? So... Uh, it's the demonstrative fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay. We go to home on the long side. Anyone else? This was a, this is more of a summary because we went over a lot of this last time, at, and in the second hour last time. Anyone else? Any other? Sharing because of closeness. Sharing because of closeness. All right. Certainly, these words are all in there. Did anybody? Uh, anyone? Anyone else? I kind of thought more of a, of a behavior of relationship, and so it's more than just a description of what a relationship is, it's a behavior of a relationship. Okay, all right. So it's uh, more, less, I mean, it's more of an action than an attitude. Is that, in other words, when, when koinonia happens, it's not really just that we're thinking the same so much, but we're involved in some activity together. Is that, is that and kind of more instead of just observing something, you're participating in it. So yeah, okay. that action. Okay. And any other kind of nuances to the whole idea of this topic of what is koinonia, as you guys did your summary work on it? Uh, this is very important right here. Right? We <coughs> don't have koinonia unless we have the Holy Spirit. And one of the distinctions, I think, becomes it clear. Well, open your Bibles up to um, Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. <laughs> so this follows, obviously, a huge uh, moment in the church. As you know, Acts 2 is, it describes the day of Pentecost and really the birth of the, of the church as we know it. And Acts 2.42 is a summary verse, if you will, of what was happening in the church in the early, early days. And uh, somebody you've got uh, an ID here? Go ahead. Go ahead and read 2.42 if you would. They have devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching uh, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay. Uh, it, as you have done that summary, it, when they say fellowship in Acts 2.42, what picture or idea do you think is happening? If you were to walk into the first century church and they were doing apostles' teaching fellowship, the, the ministry of the, the communion and 
prayer, what would the Koinonia part look like? What do you think? I think sharing what they just went through. All okay. the different experiences of the last three years and that, that conversational piece and contributing to each other and okay. conversations with so, that. So we might even say that uh, some of the dynamics that happen out of Koinonia would be things like encouragement, Right. Uh, did anybody do uh, uh, Paracletus for their uh, the second topic? It's the English. Advocate. 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 I did. First John, two two. So, what what are some of the other words? Advocate's two one. Two one. Okay. Well, what are some of the other words besides Help encourager? Okay. Um, the, the other one is comforter, uh, if we're right here. Neither of which are quite there. But, uh, um, and then uh, counselor, uh, attorney at the, at, a, at the bar, particular bar. So, if koinonia specifically is a fellowship connected to the Holy Spirit, and it is, because we can use the word fellowship, but a fellowship apart from what the Holy Spirit does is some other dynamic than koinonia. Koinonia is what was happening in the church. So it was happening among believers. So it's happening among those who have been regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit. So whatever koinonia is, it has something to do with something they have in common. Did everybody get that out of, out of koinonia? It's something that they have in common. And it's, so, you know, these dynamics that are occurring in, under koinonia, what, what I want to know is, how does this work for, against, or neutral on the issue of koinonia, based on your study? You know? <laughs> it all depends on what? How good it cooks later. Yeah, how good it cooks? <laughs> on the conversation over the potato. It is is this a substitute? I mean, is that when we is that koinonia in and of itself? No, no, yeah. no, it's not. It's one of the genre. It can be a vehicle. It can yeah. be a vehicle. Yeah. It can actually. The, I'd say the purpose of these kinds of things is to get to here, mm -hmm. right? It's so that the actual dynamics of sharing because of closeness. And I, you know, uh, another thing I would have put in here is that it, they share a common. And what they have in common is mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're on the same page, same same in heart and mind. Right. And so it's 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 relational, but it's relational around a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we can have fellowship with a lot of people, but we can really only have koinonia with other believers. Would you agree with that statement? As is defined in Scripture, we cannot have koinonia with a non-believer. We saw that, remember one of the examples was in uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14 where it says, well what koinonia does that the believer have with a non-believer? Rhetorical question. No koinonia. Because the basis for the koinonia or the fellowship as we often translate it is Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ in common, you don't have koinonia. At least not the Bible's <coughs> koinonia. Okay? So, if we were to say, if we were to make a layman's definition of koinonia, we would say that it is uh, those who have been born again through faith by the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. So that's a long way to say they're believers. Who actively share in community what? Okay, we define who's involved with it, but what do they actually do? In, in, the, in the different references that you had as you wrapped up your definition of the topic. Go ahead. They practice Christian love. They, they, practice, practice, Christian love. Yeah. they practice all this right here. It's not surprising that Koinonia comes in the church that, that all of the things that the Holy Spirit is to the, the body of Christ are the very dynamics that would be happening in the body of Christ. Not surprising. So, in that sense, you know, when we have potlucks or whatever we do, and we call them fellowships sometimes, they really are, I, I think that's a great term, they're vehicles 
where we would hope that this happens. It doesn't always, because I don't think we're always intentional about it. But we would hope that you get past talking about how good whatever the dish is, and at some point you begin to maybe just listen, or to encourage, or to counsel, or to whatever it would be that would be mutually affirming for those who are following. I th and I think one of the key factors there is the word devoted. Because that, if you, if you don't have a potluck, if you don't have time together, if you don't meet together, if you don't spend time together, if you don't live life together, you're not going to have coin in hand. You got you. It's not in. It's not. <laughs> it's not at a distance. Mm -hmm. You can have it at a distance if you've developed it first. Yeah. Uh, so if you were, if you did your uh, work on this, of course, we we were looking for koinonia as a topic, but specifically we were. We wanted to know about koinonia and the book of First John, where the word occurs uh, three times. Four. Four times. So it occurs in one through twice. Uh, at least in the, in, the, in the six and seven. Right. Okay, so where it occurs in First John four times out of the 28 occurrences or 18 occurrences in, in the New Testament. Um, <coughs> Is there anything that we learn about koinonia? Because actually, First John sheds as much light on koinonia as really any other passage in the New Testament, because of what it says in those three verses right there. It, like you were saying, it's based on your relationship with God. If you don't have that, if you haven't agreed with God that you are a sinner and repented from that, and you don't have that relationship with God, you can't have. It, yeah. it starts there, and it. And it continues from there because if you don't keep that right relationship, then you can't have a right relationship. And, and what was the what was the, the metaphor term that John uses to describe that? Um, Remember, it was a light. Light enough. Yeah, yeah. walking the light. Yeah. Um, that's what's yeah. interesting. But, but he uses fellowship. He uses fellowship in you and the other guy in Christ mm -hmm. and God all in the, the same sentence. Right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other perspectives on coin on you? Obviously, that's a lot of work to do for just, just one word. But because the word occurs three times in our passage, you would want to, if you were, if you're going to do a, uh, any kind of study, you'd want to look at these issues. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, hear from various ones of you some of the other topics. I heard one of them, so. Um, that, you, that came out of the I heard that one of you, Mark, did seem. Talk about that in a minute. Who else? What, what, what other topics did you choose? What? I did propitiation. Propitiation for you. I did sin. No, I didn't. You did propitiation? I did. He did sin. Sin. Oh, man. But I didn't get all the way through it. I mean, <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> really? Yeah. Sam, <laughs> sample study. Any, anyone else? What, what, what? Confess. Confess, okay. Manifest. Manifest? Uh, cleanse. Um, was did. there, was it, that a, you did manifest? Uh, how many uh, hits did you get in, in the 49. New Testament? 49. 49. Oh, interesting. Just out of curiosity, how many on this one? Two. Uh, Sing. I, I went mainly to John, the okay. gospel, because right. and so, so it's 59 total that they're... How many in John? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17. 17. How many for Two. 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 In all, in all the John's writings or the, all the New Testament? In all the New Testament. In all the New Testament, the little John's, or the John. So they're both the first John. John. Okay. First John. Uh, sin beyond count. <laughs> or did you get a number? <laughs> you didn't count. Uh, unconfessed. Who did confess? I did. Okay. 24. 24. And cleanse? 28. 28. Okay. And any other topics? Proclaim. 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 And then 36, 40, there's 46 or so. Okay. 46. And advocate? We have five. And I ended up doing advocate because there was only five. I threw in propitiation. 
<laughs> they got two more. So they got five plus two. <laughs> but it turned out to be interesting because John is the only one that uses either term anywhere yeah. in the, the New Testament. Yeah. That, that is why John is very interesting to study because those are huge. Oh, this, this word is only used of um, the advocate was used um, differently in the um, um, King James and in the New American Standard before mm -hmm. And that was helper and comforter. Yeah. But uh, they both agree on advocate in First John. Yeah. Which again, our principle is usage determines, uh, context determines, and usage determines. Yeah. And, right. and clearly he was referring to um, an, a, a counselor, and now we get the lawyer. In front okay. Of okay. Core idea that you came away with <coughs> on scene. Well, it's used several different ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's just to see what the eyes just basic, or to become acquainted with my experience in a couple instances in the Gospel of John, but then there were the, to see with the mind to perceive what you really know. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was interesting how you used to look, to look upon, but also that we've seen him. And how that was a, that was a deeper thing where we've seen mm -hmm. who, who, who the person of Christ is and and really, you know, seeing that he's the Son of God. It's different than just looking upon it. It's to let it permeate your life and you, you, they get it. Okay, got it. good. That's good. On uh, propitiation, anybody else do a propitiation? No? What, what, what core? Did you did. Oh, you both did. Yeah. What core did you come away with, man? Um, that it's an appeasing. Jesus, Jesus was the appeasing. And he... Give, give me another English word for that. Um, that's what I thought. Satisfaction. 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 <laughs> Jesus was a satisfaction. Okay. He was, I, I, he was the means and he was, he was the satisfaction. Was I use the word tribute. Tribute? Mm. It was with the Godfather. It was with God trust. It's a payment. <laughs> what is this? It's a tribute like I'm Godfather. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go to the Godfather here. Okay, so, appeasing, so it was, it, and so this is a unique thing between who and who. Who does the appeasing and who's appeased? Jesus is, does the appeasing and God is appeased. So it's really between Jesus and the Father, but who benefits? We. Yeah. Yay. So, yeah. There's a Yay us. Connection. And I found this in Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> um, we didn't have that on our list, did we? No, we did that. Yeah. We were putting that no, on, we on the list. Propitiation <laughs> has a Greek word. Yes. And the root of the Greek word is a Hebrew word mm -hmm. that relates to the mercy seat. Yes. And so there's a reason that propitiation doesn't hardly have. It's always it, it's, uh, de defined by itself, right. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It has no uh, synonym. Yes. Because propitiation uh, means that what has to be given for us to be forgiven in the judgment seat. Uh, at, at judgment. Mm -hmm. So it is a uniquely, a uniquely biblical kind of a concept. And, yeah, uh, even specific to the Bible of the um, act of when our sins are, sins are forgiven. Yeah. Okay. Whether we go up or go down. Uh, who, who did manifest? Yeah. Well, what, did, what was the what was the key idea that you found when you did the talk stuff about studying the manifest? Uh, and you about First John. Um, yeah. Well, concerning First John, it was. Uh, Manifestation of Jesus Christ, the word. You, use, a, use a different word than manifest. Oh, sorry, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> the, the appearance, the showing up of the uh, realization. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Realization is a good one. Uh, real? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how to quite, quite describe it. So when, when John says that. Uh, made, made real is made real. Yeah, okay, so that's what I mean by realization. Yeah, okay. Not like yeah. re you realize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's, that's a good way to put it. Which right. was part of the point that he was real. That he was yeah. real. Yeah, that he was real. Yeah. 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 Uh, who did confess? I did. Yeah. Well, what? Um, it was um, to be in agreement mm -hmm. with 
God. How, what do we, how do we normally think of confess? Come clean. You know, oh, yeah. I'm just gonna. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got caught. Yeah, right. I, I did it. I, I, I confess. I did it. Okay, but it's really a little it's more to than that, isn't it? You see that you know it was that that you've been caught and you're not going to deny it. But this, it's more than that. It's okay. in agreement with God okay. that this is sin and it must be confessed. It must be declared. Okay. So it's a little more than just saying, "Okay, I got caught." It's, it's an acknowledgement that what God says is true, and we've come to the place where we're going to say, it's true, God. This thing that I did, said, thought, whatever, it is sin. Not just that I got caught. It's a little different, isn't it? And, and so when you, uh, how many instances of John did you find confess? Um, well, it was in John, in 2 John, let's see. Was it ever used in a, in a sense other than sin? Yes. What, what else did What else got confessed besides a person's sins? Um, well, it, is the de declared or um, conceded that uh -huh. Jesus is? Um, let's see, John uh, uh, declared or conceded that he was not the Christ. Mm -hmm. That. John the, Baptist. John, the Baptist. John the Baptist confessed mm -hmm. that he was not the Christ. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's kind of the same idea. It He's is. agreeing with what God says about himself. Exactly. I am not the Messiah. I am not. But again, it's that idea of what is what is the truth from God's perspective, and and right. that, that's absolutely true. Right. Good. Excellent. Is that um, is that the same word about the about the demon, about the spirit? If the yes. spirit does not yes. confess. Agree, say the same thing. From James, from James chapter 2? It's the same word from James 2? Yes. Okay. Everybody know what I'm talking about? James 2? Even the demons can. It's in the John. Mm -hmm. No, it's in John. No, it's in John. Uh, it's in John. It's, did Jesus oh. come in the flesh? Oh, Jesus right. come in okay. the Yeah, that one. Okay. okay. Uh, who do you cleanse? Me. Okay. Well, what, 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 so this is from the first John passage. It's. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Right. And okay. So, twice. what did you find? What is that? What's the sense there? Because it certainly doesn't mean get out of our soul. Right. Because you have the cleanse in the. I only did the New Testament. The Old Testament's got a ton of yeah, yeah. the law. But in the twenty, there, it's really in the moral sense of removing of wickedness. But within the blood part, it's kind of a thought as both. It, you can't be cleansed unless there's literal blood spilled. So there's a literal sense to a washing of blood. Because Christ didn't say. Okay, you guys are forgiven. He had to go through that suffering for it to actually happen. And yet, it's a metaphorical thing of you're cleansing a moral sense from all wickedness because of that blood. So it's interesting to use blood there because, again, it's that literal like Christ had to have his blood spilled for the cleansing to occur. Well, what's a word that, a synonym that you would use in, in place of cleanse if you wanted to communicate the idea that you discovered? What other word could you say? The blood of Jesus Christ does what from all sin? I would say because it removes us from all sin. Okay, good. To put it real, basically. Or sets us apart. So it really kind of is like dirt, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I saw that in a lot of things, too. It really is the whole cleansing part of when Christ cleanses uh, lepers and stuff like that. He's removing that filth from them, that, that social disease. stigma. Okay, you have this disease or whatever else, too. So there's a... So social part and the physical part and right. cleansing. It's all the same word for a moral sense, a Levitical sense, and the removal of wickedness. And so the antithetical would be unclean, which is that, when you look that up, there's a couple of different versions, but unclean means wickedness. So, Just out of curiosity, would you uh, did uh, in, it's in verse 7, right? First John 1, 7. 7 and 9, yeah. 7 and 9. So what's the tense voice move? Okay. Not even a word like that. Present, active, continual. Yeah, so it's present, active, and indicative. Yeah. So that just means continual. Ongoing, every day. Good. But any other. Do you have to type in, because I thought I was looking at Do you have to type in to cleanse, or did cleanse just pop up? Because I didn't see it on the. Oh, it's in a different place. Right. It's one of the blue squares. No, I know, but when, when you looked it up, is it two cleanse that you typed in? Or is it? Because when I looked up that whole section of the phrase, it didn't have any verse to. No. I'm looking at the wrong spot. 
Maybe I forgot to switch over to the yeah. 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 I knew that too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, who, did, who did this? Brooklyn? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, what was the main idea? I mean, another word for what plan is. Uh, well, there were two choices. One of them is to report, like go report to so and so. Okay. And that's not what this was talking about. This is more of a. Hey, I want to tell you something. It's more. You get more excited with it. It's not just a report. Okay. I want to give you some great tidings, and uh, I also got the impression that it's more of a of things unseen. Oh, okay. Instead of things. Great. So I'm not going to tell you about my dog, but I'm going to tell you about something that's more exciting than that. Right. And not necessarily. You get a lot more exciting with it. <clears throat> So it's, it's more about ideas. And more and about it, ideas? Ideas, is that what you're, as opposed to things or a concept or a concept? It's more, okay, so, okay, good, all right. So you proclaim a concept. And what what does it, is it verbal? Is it, uh, do you proclaim it out loud? Do you write this, it down? In this, in this, where it was, in these, yes. So it's an out it was loud. A, I'm going to, you know, I'm not just making an announcement here. I want to really tell you. Okay. Ty. Okay. So well, excited where we have it in our in our passage is uh, is it verse one? Or, yeah. Uh, in First John. Two. One two. One two. We'll go ahead and read it, there, Bobby. Okay. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life. We proclaim. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So they're proclaiming. And I want to change that. I want yeah. to shout openly. Yes. This, uh, What's the word? Yeah, you openly, so everybody knows that I'm telling you this. Mm -hmm. and you're, 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 you can hear. Well, what's the Greek word? When you looked up proclaim, what's the Greek word? I'm still. The, the Greek word? In oh, the, the Greek, Greek word? word? Is it Caruso? Uh, 518. Uh, 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 I didn't put it in there. Yeah, I did. A P A G G E L O. Yeah, it's not my Spanish, so you don't turn it into a Y. Okay, yeah, <laughs> but it's the same root from which we get the word angel, messenger. So uh, good. A anything else that I did? You know, sound like you all did excellent work on this. Okay. King James uses "sue" S H E W instead of "proclaim." Show the only other place to go. Which tells you what? It's an old archaic thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, it's probably a, a more recent manuscript, Greek manuscript, than has since been discovered since the late oh, okay. 16th century. Because if you remember, Erasmus only had access to a limited number of original manuscripts, and they were actually of a more recent dating than what has been discovered. Did you have a different Greek? Where so we have a different word than is probably a more recent manuscript. Yeah. Okay, well you can see as you've done now a, a, a limited topical study that, you know, uh, you can take any one of these and if you were going to do a two part, three part teaching series then you would pull out a couple of main ideas and the, the, the text that would, you know, most shed light on those ideas and you could develop some kind of a you know, a two, three, four part series, a topical series on an issue that comes up in a passage of scripture, open it up, and it actually is a wonderful thing if you have time to do it. As you can see, it does take some time to do all this. Um, and uh, I've always thought, uh, Russ can share with you his perspective, I've always thought the topical message was the hardest message to do. Yeah. Simply because, how do you boil it down and just get, you know, whatever, three, four ideas, and then do it in a tight enough so that it actually you're not just overwhelming your listeners with way too much information, but try to get it focused down. And I, and I have great admiration for people who can do that. Uh, I found that it's for easier for me, just much easier to just go through the text of a book because I'm already kind of in the flow of the author's thought. I'm studying it along, and I know where he's going, and it helps me to kind of plan where I'm going to go when I'm doing the message, but topical is a very effective way because sometimes you just can't really explore all of a topic by just, you know, 
reading the first verse, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've handled with our hands. And we just didn't really get a, a you know, a real sense of how that word's used and open it up, or, and the same for all the rest of these. So the topical approach is a, is a very valid approach to Bible study. And it's kind of a modified topical thing that I've, when I've messed with this, it's, it's, it's been where I would find that word or that concept in, a, in another passage. Yeah. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, well, here is this verse, it's here's this passage, and that would be the subject of the lesson or the message. And so then you've, then you've got a, your context and everything there. So it just kind of spreads it out a little bit, mm -hmm. still going through the process of exegesis, exegetical preaching, but it would be on a topical deal as right. opposed to through a book. Through and, a, you know, we, we do that all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, but, you know, now, any questions or anything else about that? topical okay what I'd like to do we are gonna so we've done four steps of uh, the uh, five step Bible study method and uh, yeah. so we're just going to cover the last one which is um, so we you've done your exegesis which is your your word studies, your circumstance study, which is really kind of your background, your biographical study, which is on the author of a particular book. Uh, we just we're, did the topical study tonight, so the last one is the paraphrase. And so um, we will, if you have your notes on the paraphrase, it should be in that set of notes that I gave you uh, a couple times ago. It'll be the last page on the paraphrase. Okay, so uh, we actually covered part of this when we were going back through the, the translation section. So there's, there's basically two theories of Bible translation. Um, there's a formal equivalence, and um, that's defined, if you have this in your notes, uh, the translator attempts to render the exact words of the original language into the receptor language. So uh, what are examples? Now, we've been over. Anybody give me an example of a current translation that is a formal equivalence? An ASP. An ASP? Yeah. New King. ESP. New King and Old King. Okay. ESP. ESP. Okay. Uh, those, those four... RSV. Yeah. Okay, those five. RSV as well. So, uh, their, and their focus is more, as you can see, they, they tend to be more wooden, and uh, because they're following the, they can't exactly follow the text because one of the ways that in the Greek uh, language they put emphasis on the main idea of a, say, a sentence is that it's the first word. Regardless of what kind of speech, whether it's noun, verb, adjective, if that's the main idea of that particular sentence, the, the author will actually put that word first. And that's how Greek, rather than an exclamation point or an underline, they'll just change the word order of a particular passage. And that's how you know it's the most important word that that author will speak. So, so they can't obviously do an exact word for word order because it wouldn't make any sense to put a word at the beginning of a sentence in English when it's out of the order of you know, subject, verb, object, modifiers, the way we normally express things. So it's not exactly, but as close as they can to the receptor language, that's what formal equivalence is. And uh, form for form, word for word. The, the other basic theory of Bible translation is the dynamic equivalence. Reproduction receptor language, English, of the closest natural equivalent of the source language, whether it's the Greek or the Hebrew. So, um, and, and the most prominent of this family, and the best, I think, is the NIV. Right. And uh, there are other dyna dynamic equivalences, and, and I think the strength of the NIV is that it's, a, it's done by committee, as opposed by uh, to one or two individuals. Uh, the, the Living Translation was uh, Kenneth Taylor. The uh, message was Eugene Peterson, and uh, not that one guy can't get it right, but that's a lot of well, that's a lot of uh, scripture for just one person to be working on, and then to give this dynamic equivalence. So I think 
the strength of the NIV is that uh, while it doesn't have the the, the, the word-for-word approach, I think it does the dynamic equivalent as well as, if not better, than any other translation I've seen. So, excellent translation, but recognize that they have a different priority, a different approach than, say, the, the, the King James or the NASB. So, the one you're going to take is, on this next assignment, uh, is, uh, is first in terms of meaning, second in terms of style. Um, so, the translation that you're going to do of the first John passage, uh, all of chapter 1, the first two verses of chapter 2, um, is the dynamic equivalence. Uh, I, I want you, and if you, maybe you've already done it, I mean, you probably have done it for parts of it by this time, I want you to express in words that you understand, that are meaningful to you, that have an impact for you, in terms of expressing what you, what you now understand John to have said in the text. It doesn't matter how many words you use, um, do any way you want to, but just rewrite the passage of 1 John based upon your exegesis of the words that you've looked at, based upon whatever you did the topical study on, based upon whatever background about Ephesus or about John that kind of brings some nuance to your understanding of that passage. All of the things that we've done, bring that to bear and sit down with your original translation, but I do not want to read a slightly changed version of your Bible translation. I want to read your paraphrase of what it means dynamically and how it has impacted you. It's the way you would explain it to the 12 year old, your 16 year old, somebody who just didn't get it at all and you go, yeah I know sometimes it's hard to understand what that means. John was saying, and then just those words, all right? Being faithful to the text. And so that's, that's really this last step here. So rephrasing passage to bring out the dynamic equivalents. We're not doing formal, we're doing dynamic. It involves interpretation. Obviously, you're going to be interpreting parts of it. Uh, but that has is not just a free interpretation of what you'd like it to mean or somebody told you that it means. It's supported by the, the proper interpretation, bringing the principles to bear as we've been going through this. And you may find yourself part way through it and you have to go back up to the top and reassess what you've done. And of course, um, as I made reference to the NIV, it's why the NIV is such a strong... Uh, Does that mean we can collaborate? If you, yeah. If you want to collaborate, collaborate. Um, I expect you'll still end up with slightly different paraphrases, but I, I think there's some, some real strength in collaborating. I like that's fine with me. I, I'm it's you know, and this is more the process, as I've said to you all along, is what I'm really interested in. But of course, on this particular instance, because it's your paraphrase, uh, there will be something in the product as well, not just the process, and you will bring much of. Uh, class discussions and the work that you've been doing through the first four steps to bear on us. Right? And I think that you will, uh, hopefully this is a passage that maybe you will find after you've worked through this for, won't take you very long, I don't think, uh, that you work for it and you go, you know what, uh, just thinking to yourself, I think I understand this passage better than I've ever understood it. And that's the goal. Yeah, clearly better than when we started. That's the goal. That's what you want to do. Okay, so um, any questions about the paraphrase? Um, this, this could take you as long as, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. Uh, but that's, that's your last assignment for this class. I think I asked this a couple weeks back. <clears throat> would you like this, because it's broken down in verse, verses? If you would like to do it that way? Well, no, I'm asking, is that the product you want? Do you want it broken down in verses, or can it just be... What, what I would like story to, about what, uh, yeah. what I would, if you write it in a story form, which is okay with me, I would like you to somewhere note to me where the verse breaks are in your thinking through it, because you're not you're not totally removing yourself from the text. You're just paraphrasing the text, so there should be some you know correspondence between your paraphrase and what I would read in any of the translations that are out there. So if you're putting together verses one and two. Make that known someplace. You know, okay. if you make so, a couple so of and then, then a, a little parentheses with one and two, and then you go on and do the next part. Just so I kind of know what it, 
Because I'm not that you're going to be so far in left field, I won't be able to figure out what you're saying, but mm -hmm. it's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of let me know where you are in the text, uh, roughly, so that it's not such a free form paraphrase that nobody could really guess what you're actually doing, First John 1, because, yeah. okay? It should be close, because of the hermeneutic principles, it should be close enough to the text that we could figure that out. Good question. Any, any other questions about this? Okay, let's take a break, and then we're going to do something different. And um, as I promised you, let me just assure you, I'm going to give you a piece of paper that is the final. Absolutely. You know what's on this study guide. I've printed it out for you. You learn the study guide, you're going to come in here and fill it out. We have time to go over that with over. Some... All right. Okay, now you can start. Okay. <laughs> you didn't get one? No. Uh, uh, I, I thought you were going to share a couple in there. Uh, yeah. Anybody yeah. else? Oh, yeah. Well, sure. yeah get one. The couples can share because uh, this, this isn't anything you're going to be responsible for, but this touches on some issues that we've talked about in the last four or five weeks, and that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention because now, this guy's going to point out this is uh, Lef Lof Lofquist. He's the director of IFCA, Independent Fundamental Church of America. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, and so anyway, they, they published this magazine, and so this is a I took it out of there and cleaned it up a little bit, and so follow along with me as I read this article. I became a Christian when the modern charismatic movement was in full bloom. As a young Christian, I talked to many sincere and kind people who were convinced that all the spiritual gifts were still operational today. After carefully demonstrating to those people from Scripture why I believe speaking in tongues has ceased, I would almost always hear a response like one of these. But I've seen it happen. Or, but it has happened to me, how can you deny that? Or, I see what you're saying, but I just can't believe that all these wonderful, sincere Christians could be wrong. We won't talk about that for a minute. But in more recent days, I'm hearing the same kind of responses, only now in regard to all sorts of other issues, and not simply the issue of spiritual gifts. This attitude was illustrated in the cover story of Christianity Today article, Reaching the First Post-Christian Generation, where this was written. An emotional experience of God is more important than its theological content. Now, if you have not heard anybody say this, just keep your ears open because you're going to hear this. An emotional experience of God in our postmodern culture is seen as more important than its theological content. This attitude is seen in the researches of contemplative spirituality, which is Roman Catholic mysticism infiltrating evangelicalism, and people who confess to be present-day prophets with their extra-biblical revelation and those who claim to have spiritual discernment and can, quote, see things. All right? We are often told that the present generation is looking for churches or worshiping communities with authenticity, good, lack of dogmatism, a focus on the arts, and diversity. And he picks up on lack of dogmatism, that phrase definitely resonates in this age of tolerance. And when so few believe in absolute truth, and so many demand tolerance, experience will transcend absolutism based on scripture. A recent poll demonstrates that Americans increasingly want to shape their own faith and invent their own uniquely personal brand of spirituality. They construct a whole series of beliefs and religious practices and relationships, all of which make sense to them and helps them to feel good about themselves. Barna reports, in some ways, he states in his report, we are creating the ultimate ecumenical movement where nothing is deemed right or wrong and all ideas, beliefs, and practices are assigned equal validity. Can anybody see that happening in our culture? Absolutely it's happening in our culture. In a later survey, Barna reported that, quote, faith views are more often adopted on the basis of dialogue, self-reflection, and observation than, and I'll supply the phrase, than they are on teaching. Feelings and emotions now play a significant role in the development of people's faith views, in many cases much more significant than information-based exercises such as listening to preaching and participating in Bible study. Look at that statement again. Feelings and emotions now play a significant role in the development of people's faith views, in many cases replacing preaching and participating in Bible study. Go ahead, Jim. What if the feelings and the emotions <clears throat> stem from the preaching and that Bible study? 
Okay, hold on to that thought. Hold on to that thought. He's going to get a little more into this. Pragmatism and relativism have gained momentum. Absolutism is waning. And with those trends, subjectivism and emotionalism are ascending. Okay? Through these influences, many Christians rely more on their own subjective experience than on the objective teachings of Scripture. Many people depend more on what they feel in their heart rather than on what they read in their Bible. Have you run into anybody like that? Everywhere. Everywhere. That explains the troubles I've had. Well, he does, this guy does a good job. That's why I wanted you to see this article because this is... Really, this is kind of the nitty gritty of what a lot of what we have studied, why we are studying um, so much about the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, the ver verbal plenary nature of what we believe God's Word to be. Okay, next section. Do all sorts of religions make the claim. Do ceilings and emotions constitute a religi religi reliable guide for truth claims? What is the proper standard of authority? Can we know we are right because we feel right? Do your experiences prove you are true before God and others? When questioned, look at this interesting mixed group. Charismatics, Mormons, Pentecostals, Catholics, and people from all sorts of denominational backgrounds often speak about their emotional experiences. They may relate how they prayed to know what was right or had an experience that gave them peace and assurance that they were right. There is no difference in their stories regarding how they arrived at the truth, yet they often thoroughly contradict them, one another, and believe the others, who use the same process, are wrong. Do feelings and experiences really prove they are correct? Uh, the reason you have blanks here, those were ads, I just took them out of the magazine, I don't want to promote anything here. The debate regarding authority in Christianity came early in church history. This is very interesting. Oregon, I think, is that how you pronounce that, Russ? I think Origen. Origen. Origen was one of the widely read writers of the early church. He was born around 8186 in Alexandria, Egypt, and he developed a system which dismissed or ignored literal meanings of Scripture in favor of allegorical ideas foreign to the text. His symbolic, mystical interpretation seemed more spiritual, more appealing than ones based on the grammatical, historical meaning of the biblical text. This is the second century after Christ. Second century. Origen's method of theology opened the door for subjectivism. What was the, the counterpart to exegesis? Do you remember the word I used? Eisegesis. Here it is. Yeah. Origen's method of theology opened the door for subjectivism, and it became the basis for many other mystics later in church history. Many centuries after Origen came the European Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. This movement was grounded originally on the hermeneutical principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone. Much emphasis was placed on the grammatical, historical meaning of the biblical text. What does it mean among the rules of grammar? What is the historical situation of the author of the people of the situation? Much emphasis. Okay, other sources of religious knowledge, such as tradition, reason, and experience, were regarded as acceptable only if in harmony with what was understood as the teachings of God's Word. But in that 16th century, I'm right at the bottom of that paragraph, there were other radical reformers heavily involved in mysticism. They believe that knowledge of God can come without means of an intervening, intervening instrument, for example, the written revelation of the Bible, and can come directly through intuition or spiritual illumination. They believe the Bible was less important than as the term inner light. They took origin as their model. These people are included in the Anabaptist wing of the Reformation, most associated with mysticism. Mystics did not form a large part of the Calvinist wing, Lutheran wing, or Anglican wing of the Reformation, but they were found in large numbers among the Anabaptists. These 16th century mystics included Thomas Munzer, then the Zwickau, prophets along with Roman Catholic Teresa of Avila. Their practices, wrong interpretation of scripture, and meditation of scriptural mediation, excuse me, and mediation of scriptural authority, or setting aside of scriptural authority, directed many of the many off the course of truth. Moving a little further in history, during the 18th century evangelical revival in England and America, two differing theological methods competed for the hearts and minds of Christians. One side was the theological method of John Wesley. On the other side, George Whitefield. The theological method, the framework by which theological questions are answered, of John Wesley was in contrast to George 
Whitefield's theology. According to Wesley, the four normative sources for doing theology are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. These four have been described as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. There are, the, the footnotes are all on the last page, so at some point if you want to look at them, you can look at them. According to Wesley, okay, these four have been described and then right, pick it up. In contrast, Whitefield held to the view of the reformers sola scriptura, scripture alone. For Wesley, the scriptures were the primary source, but not the only source of theology. That is a very prevalent viewpoint in uh, Christianity in America today. The, the scriptures are the primary source, but not the only source. Tradition, reason, and experience were also part of his theological method. Consequently, the Wesleyans have emphasized experience along with scripture even to this day. And those who would agree with Whitefield today still hold the view that the scriptures are the only source for sound theology. From this brief overview of one aspect of church history, you can see that all the way back to the second century, the origin and, and excuse me, second century and origin through John Wesley, there have always been Christians who favored experience and allegorical method of interpreting scripture. Switch the page here. <clears throat> Many Christians have preferred mystical views of Christian spirituality and subjective feelings and experience as legitimate authorities. What I heard from my charismatic friends back in the 70s and what we are hearing from many postmoderns today and mystics is no different. Why is it so important to consider scripture alone in matters of faith and practice? Why should we care? The answer is obvious to me because scripture is sure and unerring in every detail. Matthew 5, 17, and 18. And as such, the Bible and it alone is the standard for truth. To interpret scripture by experience is to invite doctrinal confusion and contradiction. To, to, what the, to interpret experience by scripture is to find truth. Let me read those two again. To interpret scripture by experience, which is very subjective, is to invite doctrinal confusion and con contradiction. Turn that around, though, to interpret experience in the light of scripture is to find truth. What the Christian is required to do is, first of all, look into God's Word to see what God teaches about a matter. And with that established, he can then properly interpret his experience. He must look to the Scripture first because it is sure. With that settled, he can then evaluate experiences which are by themselves unsure, uncertain. A Christian then does not judge an experience on its own merits, but judges it by the Word of God. For an illustration, Examine the ministry of the apostles. How did they convince people what is true? Did they encourage people to pray for a feeling of peace and assurance? Did they arrange emotional meetings with exciting music shouting and clapping? Did they appeal to mysticism or subjectivism or emotionalism? No. They simply reasoned with people from the scriptures. Acts 17, 2 and 3 we read, Then Paul, as his custom was, went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And you can look up the passages at another time. Such theological discussions as contained in this article ultimately come down to the question of authority. Okay? We had a whole class period, two hours on this. What is more authoritative, scripture or experience? Does someone's experience transcend what the Bible teaches? For every experience that can be shown to prove one thing, another person's experience can be given to prove the opposite. The fact of the matter is that when someone is wrong in comparison to the Bible, he is wrong whether or not he is sincere. He may be sincere, but he is wrong nonetheless. Sincerity is not a gauge of truth. It becomes clear in the midst of confusion like this that our question can be settled in only one way. What saith the scriptures? The only standard which can adequately answer life's questions is God's word, not subjective experience. 
There are many who will read this article and will walk away unconvinced. I understand that. But I believe if you build your Christian life and ministry upon subjectivism and mysticism and experience, you are headed for shallowness in Christian understanding and a self-righteous pride in the superiority of your experiences above others' experiences. Ultimately, you're headed for heresy and false teaching. Note what Dr. Robert Thomas, a longtime ISA International Minister, <coughs> retired professor of New Testament at the Master Seminary, has written concerning theological precision. Quote, People don't often go heretical all at once. It is gradual. And they do not do so intentionally most of the time. They slip into it through shoddiness and laziness in handling the word of truth. All it takes to start down the road to heresy is a craving for something new and different. A flashy new idea, along with a little laziness or carelessness or lack of precision in handling the truth of God. All around us today are startling reminders of doctrinal slippage and outright failure. In case after case, someone who should have known the truth of God better failed in upholding that truth. Precision is a compelling desire to master the truth of God in more definitive terms, to facilitate a more accurate presentation of that truth to others, and to safeguard against doctrinal slippage that leads to error and false doctrine. End of this quote. The diligent workman of the word gives his full and tireless efforts to scrutinizing, interpreting, and explaining the scriptures. He is persistently zealous in his pursuit of God's truth as presented in the Bible because of his desire to please God, to present yourself approved to God. That's from 2 Timothy 2.15. He turns a deaf ear to those who advocate theological indefiniteness with their aversion to doctrine and attachment to experience in order to please God and not the crowd. That's the person who turns away from subjectivism. Any other way of ministering will ultimately bring shame. Paul says this kind of ministry means the diligent workmen of the word will not be ashamed. A pastor or teacher who advocates a truth-minimizing form of Christian ministry ought to be ashamed. Conclusion. Two faithful pastors have a good reminder for us in this day of relativism, subjectivism, pragmatism, and mysticism. I close with their words. First quote. Committees are necessary. Even more important is vision and the ability to move the congregation toward the goals of the church. But when push comes to shove, it's the ministry of the word that gives us our greatest impact. A church can usually put up with weak administration if it has effective preaching. But there's nothing quite as pathetic as people coming to church and returning home without any spiritual food. John Broadus, one of the founders of the Southern Baptist uh, Seminary and the author of the most influential book on preaching ever written in America, and it's listed in, your, in the footnotes here was lecturing his class just nine days before he died when he paused and he said these words. Gentlemen, if this were the last time I should ever be permitted to address you, I would feel amply repaid for consuming the whole hour endeavoring to impress upon you these two things, true piety and, like Apollos, to be men mighty in the scriptures. Broadus then paused and stood for a moment with his piercing eyes fixed upon the class. Over and over he repeated, in that slow but wonderfully impressive style that was distinctively his. Mighty in the scriptures, mighty in the scriptures. And there's the last little paragraph, and there's all the footnotes. May God help our IFCA pastors and people build their lives upon the scriptures, valuing the true <coughs> word of God and theological precision based on a careful study of the Bible. May we be mighty in the scriptures. If you attend a church where you're not seeing this happening, Thank the Lord that you're not seeing this happen. It is happening increasingly in the American church. There's a drift away, not a hard turn, but a, a subtle drift. I mean, this, I'm speaking from my own experience. A subtle drift away from the absolute teaching of Scripture to a much more gentler, experience-based understanding of what it really is, as opposed to what we've been learning in this class. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2.15. We, we never went to this verse in this particular uh, series, but it's a verse that uh, um, I, I, and I'm sure uh, Russ would tell you, we are constantly aware of, um, but I want you to see it for yourself. Uh, he made reference to it, quoted a couple of passages. 
Second Timothy. I have a quick story on tongues. On tongues? Okay. I was in a charismatic church and we were praying and sure enough, two, uh, three uh, people down, I heard tongues. Mm -hmm. Listen carefully. It was finished. I talked to the guy afterwards. He's from the Upper Peninsula, two villages over there, uh, west of the Rockies. Huh? Did he know French? Huh? Did he know French? Oh, well, yes, he was, he was French. Oh, That's so he true. wasn't praying in a language he didn't know? No. <laughs> okay, second Timothy 2.15. Everybody there? Amanda, why don't you read this? Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. All right, now this is obviously Paul speaking to Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor, but uh, this is part of his instruction to Timothy. Um, Notice where it starts in verse 14. Read 14 through 17. Actually, read 14 through 18 and get the full context. Go ahead, if you would. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philippus. Philippus. Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they have set the faith of some. Now, we don't know, but where do you suppose Hymenaeus and Philippus came up with that? Now, they're talking about what resurrection? Just so we're clear here. They're talking about the second resurrection, right? They're not about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a historical fact. They're talking about the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment. In other words, the second coming of the Lord. They're talking about that the, 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 the final resurrection has taken place. And, uh, and so, you know, so we actually have the names of two guys that went sideways yeah. here. Uh, and no wonder we don't even know who they are. We can hardly pronounce their names. But, uh, <laughs> but notice verse 15. Here, here's Paul's instruction to this young pastor. And I, I believe that this is... Uh, the thing is, that, you know, whose responsibility is it for uh, a follower of Jesus Christ to uh, accurately handle the word of truth? Is it your pastor's responsibility to make sure that you do that? Mm-hmm. Everything you pass is responsibility. It's my responsibility to teach the truth and to, and to model it, but ultimately... It may not be his alone. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, it's your responsibility. The, the idea that... Uh, it, one of the things that I cannot encourage you all enough about this. You are here in a class that is taking enormous amounts of your time, and I know that, and, and spending energy because you have a desire to be a more diligent worker. You do not want to be ashamed. You want to handle the Word of God accurately. And I believe every follower of Jesus Christ should want to handle the Word accurately. It, it would be, you know, not everybody needs to do, needs to go through the, the course that you're going through but I would submit that we have far too many people in the church who are content to just hear what someone else says, but with a filter. A filter of their own design. Whatever that filter would be. Their experience, other teachers, what they just feel like it should be. But they themselves are not diligent. They... And if God were to pull us up by the ears and say, and I'm aware of this all the time, the Lord one day is going to say, this is what I sent you to do. Are you ashamed? Because you were lazy? Or did you accurately handle the word of truth as a diligent work? Go ahead. Um, there's a parallel to this uh, in uh, 1 John that we read. Mm -hmm. that, that extends on... Um, 
this description of the perversion of the second uh, um, rising mm -hmm. is an extension of Gnosticism. Yeah. And in John, there is a parallel to uh, the admonishment uh, in, that Paul gives to Tim in uh, uh, 2 John 2, 27, I think, mm -hmm. which says that everybody, if you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit, you have the tools. <coughs> you people have the tools, know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You can't have it. You know, the, the thing that, that I still think is the strength of anybody that's an Orthodox Jew, they know their scriptures. They know their scriptures. They don't accept that Jesus is the Messiah, but in a way that most New Testament Christians don't know their scriptures at all. And, and uh, you know, that to me is the strength of, of the, uh, the, the Orthodox Jew. And so, let me just encourage you again. What you've embarked on is worth your time. Yes? So, question to you. When, you, when I read things like this and I see them, mm -hmm. and we come across, we're going to say, our young people right. who have known nothing of the scriptures. So now I'm thinking then what we spent probably the first half of this term on gives me the ammunition to say, okay, you're making all this up, so tell me, because truth is our thing. Your truth, my truth, anybody's truth. So, yeah, and you Am know I that, going to use the things that we learned in the first part as my ammunition? Well, you know, uh, certainly you have you have a way to respond to that. But you know, the, the truth, you know, to, the, the idea that truth is relative is illogical. Okay. And you know, um, you know, just think I mean, about that. If, if it if it's not true all the time, then it's not truth. Okay. So it's, that's an illogical statement. I mean, the premise is, is the wrong starting point. Okay. But, uh, but it's universal, these days. Yeah, and you know, and so a more accurate statement was everybody's got an opinion. Okay. And your opinion is no better than my opinion. And I would say, you're absolutely right. Do you suppose God has spoken to this issue that everybody else has an opinion about, that Derek does vary? Let's find out. Because God says, his word is true. Truth. Absolute. Unchanging. Because he's unchanging. Inerrant. Without mistake. Because there's no mistakes in God. And does the verse you memorized in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired by God. Profitable for teaching. For training. For correction. For reproof. So you know. You, you have that. You know, I, I, you know I, I understand where you're coming from, um, Janet, and uh, I don't know that that's the best approach, you know, in your mind you're thinking, they're out, they're out in left field here. I've got to, you know, reel them back in because they're just, yeah. that's where you go, that's how you get into Harris. Because if they're not going to look at this and take it the same level I do, then mm -hmm. what, are we, what are we chatting about? Yeah, a lot of them have never had an opportunity to look at this the way that we do, you know, and that's, one of the hardest things with youth, and especially churches like Joel Austin and all these guys, who this is exactly what they're doing, mm -hmm. is even though they're listening, I have a lot of friends mm -hmm. who listen to stuff online or watch stuff on TV, but the Bible has never even opened up. But they're listening to a preacher, right. and they're like, this is Christianity. This is all I've ever known. Yeah. This person makes millions of dollars doing this. I'm going to listen to it because our culture says that's who you listen to, but no one's ever actually opened it up and said, have you read it? Have you read it? And so when you do that, oftentimes they go, what? I didn't, okay. So then there's questions. So instead of saying that you're wrong, you need to get over here, it's like a, and. Did you know this is here? You need to put this as your, your new foundation for you, and then they'll kind of build themselves through that process. That's a great yeah. you know. For most people, their, their understanding, and think back to your, whenever you first started reading the Bible, it doesn't, I mean, it's like, I don't know. I, just, I read something, I don't even have a clue what I just read. Right? And so our right. first experience is not reinforcing. You know, we don't really get it. We think we read it, but we're not used to reading something that was written by God. We're used to reading the newspaper or, you know, something frivolous or, you know, not, not eternally important and not precise the way the Word of God is. And so we tend to bring a different kind of understanding that's not ready for this. And I think you're right, Sean. I think that we would do our young people, we'd do everybody huge 
uh, service if we just showed them how they can, first of all, understand. That's why we've basically been through all the topics that we've been through in this first course. Why we can have confidence that this is the Word of God. Why we would say, God wrote this book, and we believe that it was faithfully trans passed on to us, and that we have good translations. Now, let's see if we can understand now what it says. So you set the stage for why we believe that it's faithfully the Word of God in our hands. Now, let's see if we can understand what it says. And that's basically the two halves of what we've been doing in this course. We, we need to be the people who will, who will paracolate who will come alongside them. Yep. Good, good way to put it. You know what? One, one of the strongest ways to encourage another person is to say, you know, uh, if, listen. Listen to what their concerns are. Because most people don't approach God's Word with, I am going to be a heretic. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> Go ahead, Russ. You want to show something? In our quiet time, we were reading in Acts, and it says when the when the church was pushed out of Jerusalem, it says that the disciples went everywhere preaching the word. And the most effective thing I think we can do when we're in conversation with somebody, and they've got these ideas about whatever, and it's coming out of left field, is to have something on our heart that we have received from God to be able to say, well, you know, I was reading in God, I was reading in the Bible. This what this is what I found out from the Bible this this week or yesterday or today or you know this is what the Lord's teaching me, not through a vision, but through his word. And then you share your life with him. And and it's going to be a longer term issue because we're not dealing with with a group of people the way the first church was. They were dealing with people who did know the word. They, when they claimed and proclaimed the truth, all of those pre, those messages and acts were Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament, and everybody got it. They knew what they were talking about. So we're talking to people who don't get it, don't under, don't have the background. So, but if you say, "I got this from God's word," and that's what you're be, building your life on, that's a testimony, and you've got it there. And then come back another time, and there'll be another opportunity. And at some point, hopefully, they'll want to hear more. Is, yeah. That'd be what it comes back to that proclaiming <laughs> the the proclaiming out loud the things that God has spoken to us mm -hmm. from His Word that we can share with others. Or, very practical, very real. Homo yeah. yeah, we are saying the same thing about yeah. this. That we're saying the same thing. Right? We agree with God. Go ahead, Tom. Well, and then that goes into that. It says page nine, page three on ours, but the big paradigm shift when it says to interpret Scripture by experience is to invite doctrinal confusion and contradiction to yes. interpret experience by Scripture is to find truth. That's a huge paradigm shift. That, that is still a huge allows, paradigm shift. When yeah. you're using Scripture in that sense, you're still allowing that experience to exist. You're still allowing that person's emotion to exist and have validity. Mm -hmm. If we go in and say, your emotion is worthless, you, you yeah. slam the door in their face. That's so right. it's a, your emotion is true in your experience, and yes, it does have an impact on your life. So let's now go to a source that we can interpret it. Rather than, I mean, that, but for people, that's a big jump to yes. go from my experience is truth to my experience is like wind and fleeting versus and then this truth. Right. But with what I like about how he said this is because he uses experience in there is you can still support the experience. Yes. And yeah. I think a lot of uh, my my time with with hardcore pastors sometimes is uh, they like to shut the experience out the door. Your emotion is wrong. Mm -hmm. you, no, you did not experience that. It's like, well, yeah, I, I did. So when you slam the door in their face, they're just going to go, well, screw you on. You, you also slam the door in their ears yeah. at the same time. I'm not going to listen to yeah. You can't have a meaning. It's not possible to have a meaningful walk with God without the emotional experience. Mm -hmm. It has to be in a concept with the Bible. And uh, it reinforces it. The whole thing, it's the experience that reinforces it. So we, Experience is a significant part of the package, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it doesn't lead, it follows. Yes. You remember uh, early on when I shared with you the, the three steps of uh, a sound approach to scripture? What does it say? Observation, we spent some time with that. What does it mean? Hermeneutics, grammatical historical principles that we didn't invent them, they've been around since the first century. What does it mean? So we observe the text for what it says. We, we draw the meaning out through the, the fairly complex, but it can be a simple one as well. And that's, that's the, the task for the, the one who would explain scripture. And the final step is, how does it work in my life? Application. But for most people, 
Steps one and two are not in view. It is, what does that mean to me in my life? They've gone straight to application, not having done the work at all to determine what it actually said, what it means with sound hermeneutical principles, and they've gone straight to a very personal subjective application that if by chance it happens to reflect what the scripture is actually talking about, that would be nice. But in many cases, it's just <coughs> sideways. What I want it to mean. And, or, you know, keying off one or two words in the English that connect to some other idea or something that they... It's very fuzzy, though. But you can see that for us to be diligent workmen who accurately handle the word of truth, not being ashamed, you can't short-circuit that process. You have to be faithful to what the text says, and that, that's why grammatical historical, what was the context, what was the author coming from, what was, you know, what was the situation in Ephesus, what would those people have understood, what was John addressing, and when you get that, what does it actually say, then now you're ready to begin to interpret what it probably means given that grammatical historical context. Now that you know what it means, because you have gone that far, you go, okay, this is what it would have most likely meant to a first century citizen of Ephesus who was a member of the church that, that named Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The best to our understanding, this is probably what it meant to them. Now I got it for them. Do I have a comparable, parallel, somewhat similar circumstance, issue, whatever in my life that this would apply now that I understand it? Now you're ready to do that work. Without the first two steps, though. Yeah, but, you know, that's a nice cut and dried description. However, with the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, the word, the word of God actually is living and active, and it, it actually does something itself. So you just made an academic description, but the thing that happens isn't academic. Although, granted, you know, the workmanship, like what does it say, what does it mean, is essential. But the Holy Spirit still uses that, you know, to basically bring in the person's emotional part yeah. yeah, but I think, you know, in Bible studies, one of the things that a couple weeks ago I kind of ranted about Bible studies and Bill kind of cheated. And this, mm -hmm. this goes to that point because oftentimes I sat in Bible studies in college and they were run by peers who would go, we read a passage, you go, what does this mean to you? That was the first question out of their mouth. Waiting for that, well, the Holy Spirit will tell me what it means. And it's like, well, then why am I here sitting in a group? And I got kicked out of a couple Bible studies because I was a kid going, <laughs> No, let's look at this. Hey, I want. What's? Why is he saying it this way? Why is there a contradiction here and all that kind of stuff? But a lot of Bible studies are that, and this certain group that ran this one in my college, but was well, we're going to experience the scripture. And my take was, well, I don't want to experience it. I want to learn what it says. And so a lot of Bible studies start with that. What does it mean to you? And they just jump past those first two steps that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What do you see in this? Yeah, and it's like, well, for me, you know, I had a bad week this week, so this means I should you know, <laughs> persevere. Yeah. Okay, but what? Great. I'm glad you got that out of it. And it feels very good, and everyone likes it. And it's, oh, good job. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really say anything what, you know, I could have. Yeah. That's, not, that's not a wrong idea either. I mean, that's a great right. idea. Yeah. But it's not the Word of God. You know, you can get that from reading any inspirational book. Yeah, and you know, you're, I, I take what you, I, I hear what you say, Linda. The, the, the issue about, yes, the Holy Spirit can speak to me, but let's just ask this question. Does the Holy Spirit contradict the Holy Spirit? Not often. <laughs> <laughs> but when they do, I found out I misunderstood. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We've been taught to align ourselves. I thought you did, but I was wrong. Yeah. But in, in what my original question, see, when I hear you say what you just said, mm -hmm. that shows me, look, as rational people, I can reason with you, like Paul with you. Mm -hmm. Here is a historical context. Here's this. And they're going, oh, oh, this is real. Yeah. You know, oh, this I, is actually historical. Oh, I thought this was all figured out. Yeah, so. I mean, that, that's putting things yeah. in my head going, okay, well, if you met someone who would give you the time, yeah. the other is having a relationship. Well, if you look at what you guys experienced as you, as you went through and you worked through the steps of study, what did it do to you? It, the Word of God, the Spirit of God did something in you, and you go, whoa, this, this is something. 
Yeah. It's alive and it's li alive in me. It wasn't just an academic thing, even though it, there's a process, an academic process. It's, it, it, you're pulling the trigger. You know, you're not arguing about whether the gun will shoot, you just pull the trigger. Here is God's word and, and when you get into it and look at it, it's alive and it does. It, it will penetrate your heart. Mm -hmm. It will light up your life. It will put you on the ground. So. Like Sean said too, it's hard to get people who will take the time and want yeah. to invest any time at all. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the most culture, telling yeah. word in Second Timothy two fifteen is the word workman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you, it, we're not hitchhikers to the word of God. Yeah. Most. We're not just passing by on you know Amtrak and the word of God's there, and, we, and we're just we're workmen, diligent workmen accurately handling the word of truth. There is a responsibility. I'm not saying though, there's not room for the Holy Spirit here, but what I'm saying is, is that, to, you know, and what, what I'm hearing from you is we've come full circle back to the second century origin again in our churches. More than we realize, people are basically seat of the pants understanding of God's word. What does it mean to me? This is what I feel about it. This was my experience. And we're, as you said, the paradigm shift is we are defining scripture by our experience rather than defining our experience by scripture. And that's a huge difference. And you're going to go sideways with that every time. Well, the cultural problem is huge. You know, I mean, Kenya, when I was down there, this big, their Sunday for church is 6 a.m. to about 8 p.m. I mean, they are there in church all day. Here we have a hard time taking an hour out of our day to focus on anything. So, which I find ironical in the United States when we are the most, we do more hours of work than any other country in a work week mm -hmm. for our job. And we take less vacation time than any other country in the world. And yet, when it comes to things that matter, we spend probably the least amount of time compared to third world countries and everyone else who is. You know, there's more Christians in China than there are Americans. And, it's, and they are not even allowed to be Christian in China. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I wanted you to have some sense of, you know, what, what's, what, what you're going to face if you're unaware of it. It sounds like most of you are aware of it, though. I've got a daughter in the middle of this, just like Jen describes. Yeah. Well, well, in our church, for example, I'll give you an issue from, uh, I haven't talked to Dwayne about this. Uh, the, uh, we have a, a, a couple of uh, young women that are uh, leading a teen girl, uh, basically our youth group is boys and girls are right now, it's two different groups, but the teen girls, and, and there's three or four or five of them, depending on any given week, come together. And they've just finished a series, and they came to me and they said, we want to study another series. What do you recommend? By this author or that author. And my first thought is, why don't you just study the Bible? Now, there's nothing wrong with Bible studies that are written by someone, but it's, to me, a lot of times, it's a little bit of like secondhand information. And, uh, you know, I, I, for myself, would rather just study the Scripture myself. And uh, not that the people who do Bible studies, I'm, please don't talk to me about Beth Moore and all the great Bible teachers that are out there. They're wonderful Bible teachers. But I think what that does is it encourages uh, an unworkmanlike approach to the scriptures. Yeah. In other words, I'll let someone else do the work, and then they can tell me what it means. And I, I would just say to them, Okay, if you're not willing to do the work yourself, that's better than not interacting with the scriptures at all. That's really much better than just ignoring that God even give us, gave us his word. But I think would be even more profitable if you actually spend some time with the word of God yourself. Now, it is not, I mean, if you have learned anything here, you've learned there's a whole lot more to this than you probably thought there was. And let me just encourage you, we've barely scratched the surface here. There's a whole lot more. And that's why you can actually, you can spend a lifetime at whatever pace, at whatever 
approach you want to take, and the Word of God will be endlessly fascinating and exciting to open up and continue to read for a lifetime. You'll never get to the bottom. And yet, at any given day, you will feel profoundly that the Lord has spoken to you through His Word. And that's a different experience for me personally than to think that I just had some kind of a undefined spiritual whatever. I'm not big on that. And I'll say, you know, I came to Christianity just exactly the way that you described. When I first became a Christian, I was 25 years old, and um, I was single, kind of floating around, and, and I was moving to different place to place. And uh, I landed at a town in California, and I met some other Christian people about my age, and they said, come to church with us. And I said, sure. And uh, I had no idea. I'd grown Catholicism, and back then they, it was still Latin, and I didn't, I didn't understand any of it. And, but so I, I started going to this church, and it was a uh, charismatic slash Pentecostal church, and everybody in that room was in their 20s, and it just so it was a whole bunch of people my age, and uh, and they immediately started speaking in tongues, and not knowing anything, I said, "What's going on?" I just looked at the person next to me, and and they said, "Well, they're speaking in tongues." I said, "What's that?" And they explained it to me in their own understanding, and I said, so where does that come from? And they said, well, we'll teach you. And uh, they, they, they taught people how to speak in tongues. And so they taught me. And uh, it, was a, it was actually a, kind of like a three-step process. Now, I've since learned that it's actually not something that you're taught. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. But back then, I didn't know. I was brand new. And so they taught me how to speak in tongues. And so I would go to their meetings with all of them, and when it was tongue-speaking time, I could join right in because I was kind of new at it, but I understood that you basically just opened your mouth and said anything. And everybody was doing the same thing, but it kind of felt really good because we were all doing it together. I had no clue what it meant. I had no clue that there was anything more to it than that. I thought it was just something that you learned at church. Well, that was my first church that I went to as a brand new baby Christian at 25 years old. Just a version of Latin. Yeah, and it, it was. And I, I was, I actually, I had three years of Latin that I went to, uh, anyway. But, um, so I, I actually was using Latin because I thought, well, nobody knows Latin in this one. So <laughs> I'll just use some Latin here and it'll tell like, so I was using some Latin too. But, uh, uh, but you know, and then again, you know, being kind of footloose, I eventually wandered off to someplace else. And eventually, praise God, I landed in a church not knowing any better myself that actually taught the Word of God from the Bible. Wow. Was that refreshing? But that's not where I started out. I went to a place and they said, so after the first couple of times they said, how do you speak in tongues? Whatever that is. And they said, you got an hour or something? Come early and we'll teach you. They did. They taught me how to do that. So. I've never been around that. What? What do you actually? I, I don't get it. You want me to teach you to? It might take more than an hour. You can come in during the break. They just start making noises. Right? No, you know what? Uh, I, I don't want to have a long discussion on tongues other than to say this. Tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Clearly taught as a gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the only definition that we have of tongues, regardless of what anybody may tell you, is from this book. Any other definition of tongues, uh, aside from what this book teaches us, is frankly subjective. All right, And I would say that most of what happens today in the name of tongues is tongues two, not tongues one. Okay, Tongues one is speaking in a language you don't know that someone in your audience does know. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Tongues two is what is most often practiced today or under the euphemism of private prayer language. No interpretation, no sense that it's a language at all, or earthly language anyway, maybe a heavenly language, sometimes referred to. I would say that is tongues too. Is it in here? I don't find it in here. So that all of a sudden is a practice that this article we just read would there it is. That's a subjective, personal, experiential 
And rather than allowing scripture to define that subjective personal experience, which is real for people, I don't want to diminish that, they, there's a new category, it's tongues too. And that's what I call it, because it's not in here. It's gibberish. So. Are they sincere? Yes. Please don't mistake me. They are sincere. <laughs> Is it reflecting the truth? truth. Okay, so I want you to have that article so we go with it. Okay, um, uh, what we're going to do here, I promise you we do this, so here it is. Um, not on this piece of paper, you do not need to know it. Cool. There is nothing that is not on this piece of paper that's on that final. And yet everything that is on this piece of paper is on that final. Okay? okay. So don't bother studying the things that are not on this piece of paper. You don't need to know that there was a lot of other things we covered in our notes. You don't need to know those things. But on these issues, and I took the words right out of some of the, you know, what are the, what are the, the, uh, the, the uh, errors to avoid for the interpreter. And, you'll, and, and it, you won't need to know all of them on almost any of those lists. There's a couple of them you'll need to know them all. But it'll be name, name uh, three of the five uh, uh, areas to avoid for the interpreter, the personally interpreter, bias, you know, prejudice. You know, you, you'll know them, they're on your list. So just look for the headings in your notes. Uh, almost all of those are taken right out of the headings of your notes. And just know what's on there, define the terms. You see any terms that you don't have a vague sense of what they might mean? Uh, if you do, this would be the time to ask. Um, perhaps I didn't talk about the last one on the first uh, section, apologetics. Did I talk about apologetics at all? Okay. Apologetics is the science of defending the faith and truth. Apologetics is the science of defending the faith and truth. You can't have a book. Yeah. <laughs> and that's as much definition as I want for any of these terms. Short, I'm not looking for long statements here. But I'll just tell you this, every single one of those terms is on the test. Know them and you'll do fine. There's another set toward the bottom of the page. Know those and you will do fine. When it says, be familiar with the internal and external proofs, be able to enumerate them. When it says, be, be familiar with the methods God used in special inspiration, go through your notes. You'll find that exact heading in your notes. Methods God used in special inspiration, right? It's right there in your notes. Everything is taken directly off your notes. Okay? There's nothing here that didn't come out of the, the notes that you have in your possession. Can we make the uh, figures speak to extra credit? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, to define them, I, I, you know, there were 24, Yeah. okay? So I'm picking the 10 that I think are the most common in Scripture, all right? And you should, they aren't necessarily the first 10 that we went over that are in your notes, but the 10 that uh, hopefully you would key on that as well. So you probably will have to have a sense of being able to define, but most of them are just like four, you know? Three or four short words. They're not long definitions, but if you know the definition, say, of a parable, I gave one away. You don't have to study that one. Parable. I'm going to give you two passages underneath parable. Tell me which one okay. is the best example of what a parable is. You don't have to give me a passage from Scripture. I'm going to give you two Scripture passages under each of ten figures of speech. You're going to have to define the figure of speech. What's a parable? Okay? 
Just give it to me in a few short words, and then just underline the one. You'll have to bring your Bible. Bring your Bible. Okay? We aren't, we aren't doing it like on the other test. No, we it's not like that. I'm going to give you the two passages. You're going to tell me which one is the best example of that figure of speech. Okay, but we have to define it first. You have to define it. You have to tell me what a parable is. You have to tell me what a symbol is. You have to tell me what an allegory is. You have to tell me what a, okay, a synecdoche is or whatever it might be. Metonymy, if you're listening, I'm giving them away to you right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. You just have to, have to tell me what they are, define them, and then, then there'll be two but there'll be two per verses. All right? Look them up in your Bible. Oh, this one's a synecdoche. No, I don't think that was it. Okay, I'll keep this. That's the one. Next one. Define it. Look at the two, two passages that I give as examples. Tell me which one is the example. That's much better than this. Okay? All right? I um, for the memorization parts, are we... There's going to be two little marks on this test. One will say, yes, I memorized and quoted Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Yes, I memorized and quoted to someone 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. Yes and no on each of those. You just tell me if you did that. Okay? No, you don't do it in here. This is an honor thing. So if you've done that by Thursday, then you'll be able to check those off. Yes, I did it. Yes, I did it. Okay? Uh, yeah, it's a lot of material, but frankly, this is a, a way that this is the material that I think is pretty important, and so I want you to interact with it. And uh, if you study this, you'll just come in and just fill this thing out. This is the test. You you have the test in your hands. Okay, that's it. We need a concordance. No, nope. all you need is your Bible. And uh, I'd rather you not do this with your notes in hand, um, because it is to be a learning kind of thing. So. The time you spend between now and then, okay, I know I know what general inspiration is, I know what special inspiration is, you know, and then just kind of move on to the list. Okay, yeah, I, I've forgotten what the internal proofs of the Bible's inspiration is. Okay, here's what they are. These are the external proofs, right? Just to reinforce these things for you, and that's really the main thing. And the point of the test is really just to reinforce what you've learned, hopefully, or remind you. Okay? So, here's the test. This is it. Nothing more. And it will be include all of that. Yes. So a question about next class. It's New Testament survey, correct? Yes. Um, do you have the syllabus for that? Because some people are at the talk here asking about it, but I, I, I will. Recruit. I'll have it for you Thursday. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Russ and I switch. <coughs> you can be the teacher and I will run the camera. And we'll be purchasing the books this week. Yeah. That as well. Does anybody know who's coming next semester? Yeah. So we, we figured to buy books for all of you. Do you know of anybody else that we wouldn't know that might come that we should be buying? Because we have to buy textbooks ahead of time, so they're here the first time. Okay, I'm going to work on Good. Okay. Yeah. Just, just the right down and back, right? When does the next semester start? When does the next semester start? There's two or three more guys. 26th. Pardon me? March 26th. March, Monday, March 26th. So it's, uh, uh, we get a two week break. Two, two full weeks off and we'll start. And we'll be done the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend. And that'll be it. And we won't pick up again until mid September. So long summer break. Right? So, uh, and so basically you're going to go through the 27 books of the New Testament and uh, you'll do some you'll point your textbook which is going to give you some historical background of each book and author as we've done. So you're going to do that for each book. You get overviews of the books and major themes. You're going to, one of your textbooks is going to be a, a book of maps and charts and tables so you can kind of see where this stuff happened and what the journeys look of Paul look like and you know what the temple in Jerusalem if you haven't seen that kind of stuff we want you to actually have a much better handle on what was going on through the writings of the and you know obviously you know there's only whatever 18 sessions I think for 27 books I mean how much time can you spend so uh, the work will be different. Uh, Russ, a heads up on what the work. Yeah, the, the work is going to be. Uh, there's, there's two books we're getting. Uh, one will be uh, the book that you read all the way through. Uh, I've got it broken up into eight sections. So if you just want every Monday, I read it. I read it. If you want to save it all till the end, you can do that. Uh, the other major assignment will be reading through the New Testament uh, with every chapter uh, writing one to five questions for that chapter that about if you were leading a Bible study, what would you expect people to ask you? Or what are the questions you would want to ask? 
to get to ask, or the things that you don't know, oh, I don't know what this is, I want to know what, I wish I knew what that was. So the idea is starting this idea of writing, writing questions, you learn the skill, you plot, put some, plant some seeds for your own study down the road, um, and so that'll be like a little journal type thing, you'll keep a track of that and we'll share some of those in class uh, from time to time. And with that, before you start reading Matthew, the, the maps and charts uh, section has a um, couple of pages on Matthew and a couple on Mark. So you'll read that before you start reading Matthew. Go through those chapters, make your notes, read the beginning of Luke, Mark, then do that. And that's just a, a long going assignment by the end of the end of the time. Three three to four chapters a day. That's what it works out to be. Uh, so you read, you get to read it, but you also interact with it, but not as much in a devotional setting as it is in a workman type setting of okay what what think of it as a question what what are they going to ask me or what should they ask me if, if, if I was talking if I was teaching this to somebody or what are the questions I should ask about this chapter so we're going to need to write down five questions per chapter one to five at least one for every chapter and is, and don't go beyond five because otherwise you could be there forever on some of those chapters okay and so you say the reading will be about three chapters a day. Yeah. Is there a good software out there that you can, because like, I can't remember my own handwriting kind of person, so is there a good software that downloads the Bible in a form where you can add comments and add notes and, and work on it like a Word document? Or uh, do I might just going to have to cut and paste everything? Because I can download, do that, but I didn't know. You can download the Blue Letter Bible and then... Is uh, it editable though? Uh, you can, once you get it on your downloaded sheet, you can do anything you can do Okay. Yourself. So I spread out lines and. Uh, okay. Yeah, you'll have you'll have to cut and paste. Yeah. Something that'll make it into, you know, a, a document you work with. Yeah. So you could always print it, have a blue letter, <laughs> and, and then scan it back in. Yeah. My scanner will do that. Yeah, but you can, that. if you copy from the letter. Um, it yeah, just because I can cut and paste everything over too. I just was wondering if there was a good software that already allowed you to add those kind of notes and thoughts and your own references and mission design. Probably not, probably not as easy for New American Standard because yeah. that's money. That's a money thing. Right. You've got to buy that. So. Okay. But you can cut and paste but you can right. out you of it. And find the, the whole thing in just a text, .txt a text yeah. format. Then you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. But if, Nate, if Nathan can find something, he'll stick it on our website. That'd be nice. Well, there's you, a good usable workable for sure. Yeah, when you cut and paste from Blue Letter Bible, no matter which version you use, when you get a new piece of paper, oh, yeah. it's in word processing. Um, you can save it to a Word document. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, because I could definitely do that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just was hoping that there was a but, format that kind of helps you that. Okay, all if you don't have assignments in that were due, so be it. there's so grace here until days. Thursday night. No, there's no late penalties for any assignments that haven't been handed in. Um, and so if you didn't check off that you've done all the reading and you can finish the reading between now on the two books and uh, Thursday, come in and check it off. Any written assignments that you didn't get done for whatever reason and you want to get them in by then, that would be acceptable. And of course, remember this is, and uh, the only current assignment is your paraphrase of 1 John 1 and the first two verses of 1 John 2. Okay, so that's a handing assignment. Are gonna do yeah, this? we're not going to get to it, Jordan, I apologize. The uh, Jesus Joseph uh, type analogy, it was, I, I had it done, and if you're interested, I could give you the answer page. And I'll, I'll run off a copy for everybody uh, to give to you next week if you're still interested in yeah. where those verses were and you didn't get them all matched up well. Uh, yeah, I'll do that for you. We just didn't have time. I apologize. Okay. Any, any other questions about what's coming up on Thursday? Any questions? Good. All right, Russ, would you close? Some Lord, we've been reminded again of the power of your word in our own lives as, as we have been stirred um, in our spirits and we have been strengthened and we have been fed. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be faithful disciples in proclaiming your truth 
your word to those around us when we have that opportunity. And Lord, we would live it out and we would speak it out uh, because, Lord, your word is, is life to us and uh, your power in us to change us. Thank you, Lord, for the, the workmanship that has been put forward uh, by Rob and by these students. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless, continue to guide and protect. And I pray that uh, when, when we get back together on Thursday, that the uh, going back over the lessons of this course and through this test, that it would be uh, a great joy to, to, to see what we have learned and, and where we've come and uh, what you've done in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us and all that you have done. Use us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.